So, a lot of times when you go up to speak, you have an idea, um, and you try to find Bible verses that and examples that incorporate that idea, right? That, that's one way you can do it. It's like, I really want to talk about God's love. So you go and you find all the verses about God's love with some particular perspective that you're looking for, and then you present it. And that's awesome. Sometimes there's a idea that's been on your heart that's shown up all throughout Scripture and is in every single part of your life that you can't deny it in any way, shape, or form. So to make a Scripture is literally just saying, hey, this is literally what I've been learning and doing and breathing and everything for the past life <laughs> my entire life honestly but specifically recently we're going to talk about messes we're going to go through a couple different biblical examples of messes biblical lives that are messes what are messes and then hopefully bring it back so that you can see your mess in the midst of what god is doing amen, amen. Amen, right? So let's let's just go over a couple different types of messes. What are a couple different types of messes? Anyone just yell it out. What's a mess? Financial mess. I heard shoes on the floor, I think, and then financial <laughs> messes. Yeah, those are messes. Family. Family, there's family messes. A, just, we're using mess as a very broad term, right? Everything from something crazy as like suffering and, and heartache to messes as, um, I don't know, embers spilling milk. Right, or maybe Marie spilling milk. Whoever <laughs> spilled milk, I'm not going to correct. It's mess, right? Life is messy. Life is extremely messy. This is a topic we can all relate to. Whose life isn't messy? Raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you uh, against lying. Okay. <laughs> life is messy. It's it's not that life is is always perfect, right? We get that. We were just talking. We we're saying. If I can ever find a perfect church, I'm going to scratch my head and say, what's wrong? Because even Jesus had Judas, right? Even the disciples didn't quite get it. Even the, the rock, Peter the rock, more like dumb as a rock. Just kidding. No, Peter the rock was contributed to Satan because of some of his perspectives. And he was with Jesus in the flesh for three years. All sorts of mess. Jesus says, I am about to give my life up. I'm just asking you to stay away for your sake because Satan wants to sift you. You, just for a couple hours, and they couldn't even do that. Jesus tries to take a nap. He can't even do that. There's a storm. I'm just touching on different ideas, but it's messy, right? Jesus had pretty messy life, ups and downs. We have messy lives, ups and downs. These people in Scripture have messy lives, ups and downs. The Christian life can be messy. I was going to say is messy, but sometimes it's not messy. There, You have little spurts of it, and some people are blessed to not have as much, and some people are blessed to have more because God gets glory out of everything. Um, so this this is one of the key verses. Um, hit uh, space one. Yeah, and that's the only one you can trust and it'll take care of everything. Proverbs fourteen four, where there are no oxen, the major is empty, but from the strength of an ox comes abundant harvests, right? Where there's no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come from the strength of the ox. ESV. We heard this originally for the first time in a marriage seminar. This was the first use. Basically saying that if, if, there's, if there's nothing there, if there's no players, there's no components, there's no moving, there's no adapting, there's no growth, right? It, it's clean. No right? poop. Exactly. No ox poop. You're right. There's no ox poop. It's clean. It's perfectly clean. But the abundant harvest comes from those things. Yes, Ember? Right? Sometimes a little messy to preach, right? It's this idea. It's okay. They're fine. It's this idea that it can be clean, right? As a single man, I had a really clean, uh, a structured day. I had a very... Uh, clean house all the time, no matter what, because it was just one person just doing one thing, and then boom. And then you add another person, and it's a little more messy. But the difference is, back when I was single, I couldn't accomplish near as much as we can accomplish married. And then now we have a daughter, it's definitely more mess. <laughs> but we're accomplishing more. So this is kind of one of those co concepts. You're accomplishing more for the kingdom, you're accomplishing more for yourself. There's a lot of different messes. We can think of messes that we cause on our own. We can cause other people. We see that if you help others people's messes, 
Jesus offers rewards. This is the good Samaritan. He's helping someone else's mess. Someone else was on the side of the road. Matthew 25, 37 through 40 says, The righteous one to Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothes you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? He's talking about all the things that these people did to help other people's messes, possibly not even connected to them. And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters, you did for me. <coughs> if you help other people's messes, Jesus offers rewards. And we don't do them for the rewards, but we recognize that they exist. If you, through Jesus, overcome mess, Jesus offers maturity, right? James 1, that verse that we all scratch our head up. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when various trials light upon you. For the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life the Lord has promised to those who love him. If you, through Jesus, overcome your mess, you are granted maturity. If you make a mess, who's made a mess? Yeah, right? Okay. Same question, right? It's okay, you don't have to put your hand up. Luke 18 was a good example of this. This is where the tax collector who stood at a distance hears Jesus talking. And he basically says, God have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. What happens is when you make a mess, you come to Jesus, you have a repentant heart, you have a humble heart, and he offers to forgive you when it's your mess. God works even the biggest messes for good. We know this first, Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28 is, For we know that in all things God works good for those who love and who have been called according to his purpose, right? Being conformed to his image. So let, let's look at that. Let's um, go to the next one. So this one. So we're just gonna we're just gonna do a little a little something. And we know that in all things. Okay, so what about if you're running a company and someone's running late? Is it gonna work that for good? If it's for the good of those who love him, if you love him and have been called according to his purpose, yes. Those who got born new, he also predestined to conform to the image of a son. Yes. So Let's see, God works all things. What about if God works a flat tire? Is that under all things? Yes. Yes. What about if God works a tragedy? Yes. What about if God works a little spilled milk? Yes. God will work all things for the good. We may not see it, but God works all things. All things. Now, part of that is you don't always see it. Because these were all commended for their faith, though none of them received what it had been promised, since God planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So let me see this. Romans 8, Romans 11. Does everybody know Romans 11? Romans 11 is the hall of faith. He reviews several different characters in scripture uh, from the beginning until modern day at the time. He talks about Moses and Abraham and all the patriarchs and even Samson and some of these guys. And he says, they were commended for their faith, and yet none of them received what had been promised. So they had promises. The things that they were working, that God was working for good, they didn't quite see right because God put something better for us so that only together with us, these are the apostles, this is us, they will be made perfect. So what they did works with what we're doing and they're doing, and it all comes to be made perfect to make the good. Sometimes what you're doing, you won't necessarily see it until your kids or their kids' kids. Sometimes what you're doing is actually the revelation of some before. We were talking about these great harvests uh, with, with Reinhard Bonnke in Africa, right? 76 million people coming to Christ. Yes. Insane. But what did he build it on? He built it on missionaries giving their blood hundreds and hundreds of years before we see these great revivals of, of people who've been praying and sowing and giving their lives and, and working the soil, and then you see the crop. Sometimes we're receiving the benefit of someone else's hard work, and sometimes we don't see the hard work benefit because they'll see it later. 
So what's he doing? He's working it for good, right? He's working it for good. Whether you see it or not, whether it's your lifetime or not, he's working it for good. So we're actually going to go over a couple different um, leaders in scripture, or maybe a video. A uh, video. All right. I don't know if there's sound on this, so I may just be talking. Let's see what happens. Go for it. what happened was this gentleman was painting with something you couldn't see. And at the very end, when he was all done, he shot glitter at the painting at what he was working on. You could see it. It was finally revealed. So sometimes, like we just mentioned, sometimes what God is doing, we don't see anything at first. It's not till the very end when he sprinkles his godly glitter and then you finally see the promise. You finally see the good. But know that he is. He is doing it. So I've got a couple of these. I was going to do more, but I realized this takes a long time to do. This was what is some of the highlights within scripture of Joseph's life, how we would consider uh, an up or a down, right? The messes, the messiness of his life. We see Joseph, he's one of the father's favorites, but the brothers hate him. He gets this great technical dream coat, and he's interpreting dreams, but his brothers hate him and throw him and sell him into slavery. He's, and he's actually sold twice. He's actually sold twice. He's sold and then sold to Potiphar. And then he's got kind of this lull. He goes up, he gets successes by the Lord, but then he gets down and he goes back in prison. He gets more successes by the Lord, he interprets dreams, and then he goes and he stays in prison for another two years. He interpreted King's dreams. He ends up becoming second in all of Egypt. And then at the end of his life, who, who likes this little little zigzag? It's at the top, right? He ends up becoming the second in command in all of Egypt, and even saves his own family that wasn't originally there to start with. Joseph's just, I'm, I'm going kind of quickly, but the idea is he had up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. This is a very unique mess. Some of the mess is not so beautiful, some of the mess is more beautiful on our perspective, but God sees a little different. We'll look at the next one. Let's look David's life. I didn't realize this was David's life. I started David, I mean, I'm going through the Bible, and I, I only know the whole Bathsheba thing, right? We all know David's the king of Egypt, the king of Israel, the great king, the one who's recognized and referenced even by Jesus himself and as being so great and, and so wonderful. But even, even this one moment of Bathsheba seemed to really, really take him down. But there was a lot of things before that, too. He was a shepherd out in the field. When they go to look for the king, he's left out. He ends up getting anointed as king, but he doesn't end up being king for years. Israel's in this place where they're this place where they're basically kind of scared, not doing nothing when Goliath comes, and it's not until David comes and through God's strength knocks him out, and they win. But even then, he doesn't he doesn't become king even then. He gets favors and victory, but then he's cheated against. He gets attempted murder, another attempted murder, runs away, another attempted murder. These are all by the king. And then he gets his priests killed because he lies. You can look all these up. If you want the references, I can try and find them for you. He fakes madness. He runs away. He writes some songs. Those are kind of nice. We read them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure there are more songs throughout. There was a point in David's life where he fought for the Philistines. You guys know this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He had some lows before Bathsheba, he hit some lows. Yeah. Their houses fight, there is a huge civil war, even after Saul dies. Mm -hmm. If you guys know that there's a lot that goes on, he finally gets, he becomes king, there's peace in the land, and then what did he do? Bathsheba, right? And as far as I can tell, there's a lot of ups and downs just squiggling, I just squiggle. And I'm like, there's too much ups and downs here, he's got some victories, but there's a lot of squiggles. 
So this is David's unique footprint as far as I understood from Scripture. Job, right? Another one that's kind of like, oh, I might want that one. I mean, I'd like Joseph's more, minus the whole, you know, being in prison and slavery and stuff. But this one's pretty good too, right? If you look at the wording that's given to Job, Job was one of the, the best presented people in Scripture. If you look at how he's described as honest, blameless, successful, upright, notice him by God. It says he's the, the greatest in the East. That's a title. Yeah, I know. Crazy, huh? But then what happens? The devil comes along, and there's some things going on, and he loses his material. He lost his servants. He lost his family. He lost his health. And he even got bad advice from his only friends that we were, we were referenced. Right? That's low. But what happens? We know that at the end of the story, his materials are restored plus. His family's restored plus. Health is restored plus. Some of those things doubled. Some of those things maybe even more. He ends on a high note. This is Job's footprint. Jesus' footprint. I, there was way too much for this. So this is just some highlights and lows. He, he's destined, he's baptized, he's miracles. He's, he goes to the temple. Uh, he sees people um, using the temple as a house of business. He says people wanted him king, but then people misunderstood him. And then he had ministry, but then... Peter was listening to Satan, and then Lazarus came back, and then Hosanna, and then he was betrayed, abandoned, arrested, mocked, injustice, pain, everyone left him. Yeah, this is his mom. The difference between the other ones and this one is we know what happens after his death, right? So we know there's more. The other ones, not so much. In the same way that the other ones had a future that actually goes sky high, rocket off. So does everyone mention everyone that lives by faith, everyone who knows him. It's easy with Jesus. We see this. Why doesn't this bother us? Why doesn't that bother us? Because we know where he ends up, right? This doesn't bother us because we know where he ends up. So in our life, when we are down here, we need to understand that we'll shoot back up. Unless you're Elijah and you'll be taken up. You know? Or probably you know, I think he did. Oh, is anyone who knew that this was coming? Paul was coming? Someone knew, someone, someone knew Paul was coming. <laughs> so, Paul. Let's, let's talk about Paul's mess, right? This is, this is earthly perspective of mess, right? We're, we're on the same. This is kind of what people would see, what we would see. Let's talk about how Jesus introduces himself to, to Saul, who turns into Paul. Saul was, was persecuting Christians, probably the greatest persecutor at the time. And what happens is Jesus blinds him. All right, that's a good introduction. And, and he's basically lost until this gentleman has to come and through, through the Spirit of God give him his sight back. Now what happens there is it says, it's this very interesting wording of how he really introduces himself to what Saul's going to do, right? If anyone's a car salesman, does any type of salesman, you, you highlight the good parts, right? You say, hey, this is a good feature. Hey, this is uh, it goes really fast. Hey, it's got a stirrup. You don't say, yeah, but you know it's not going to start. You know when it's cold. You know you're not going to say things like, yeah, but it dents real easy. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we couldn't get that smell out the trunk, right? Those those things aren't the things that you mention when you're trying to sell something to somebody. <laughs> so in the same way, Jesus doesn't use the tactics we're used to for selling this idea, selling or presenting rather, presenting this idea of Paul's ministry. After he's blinded, he, the gentleman is told to come says, in Acts 9, 16, he says, I will show him how much he's going to have joy for my name. No, no, I misquoted that. I know, gotcha, Helen. Acts 9, 16 says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Okay, got it. That was the intro. Hey, let me blind you and then show you how much you're going to suffer for me. We see that we're supposed to see these trials as pure joy. It doesn't make sense, right? Because we're looking at it like this. It doesn't make sense. In Matthew 16, Mark 8, Luke 9, 23, it says, Take up your golden flowing robes and follow me with a cloud underneath your feet. No, he says, Take up your cross and follow me. <laughs> Just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, 
so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. We want to know Christ, Philippians 3. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. So, okay, so we want to know Christ. Yes, right? We're all on board. Philippians 3.10. Yeah, I want to know Christ. You know the power of his resurrection. Yeah, I want to know the power of his resurrection. And then, and participate in his sufferings. Oh, did we just take the first two? <laughs> do we have to participate in his sufferings too? Becoming like him in his death, so somehow attaining the resurrection of the dead. Therefore, 1 Peter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when the glory is revealed. There's a couple items there. The suffering we're talking about is, is often attributed to following Christ. If you're following for Christ, you're persecuted. Right, we talked about rewards. We talked about maturity. Those are all presented to you. We have to have the right perspective. See, Jesus, when he was about to go to the cross, even he went to the Father and said, Father, if it's possible, take this from me. And I want you to understand that it's not that you necessarily have to just accept all of this. I'm not saying that. You have to seek God, as Pastor Jim was saying. Every situation is different. What I'm presenting to you is maybe the side that's not presented as much. It's always different. The Spirit is the one who tells you and leads you. Sometimes we go to God just instantly, well, this is something I don't like, so instantly it must, must be from Satan. So I'm just going to pray against it. Always, every time. It's not in my theology, always every time. We talked about Nicodemus last time. He was the most, he, he knew the most arguably of anyone at the time, and even he was wrong about certain things. God is not <laughs> God is not in the business of being predictable all the time. Can we get that? Sometimes he just shows up in ways you don't think he's going to. Sometimes he's going to operate in ways you don't expect. Yeah, he does. He's going to do that on purpose. He's, he doesn't want a religion where you just, nope, well, this is this, so I just pray against it every single time. Even the things that you think are 100%, there's a good chance you'll find some scripture in the Bible that'll say it's 99, actually, 99.9. .9. So yes, absolutely, default there. Default, default to pray against these things, absolutely. But be open that it's possible that this might not be one of those defaults. He, the, this, there's a verse that says Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? He came to give life and life more abundant. We know this verse, John. So why is it that there's actually a story where there's a fig tree and Jesus curses it and it dies? There can be an exception. The idea is do not, do not, I, I'm begging you, always seek God. Always, always seek God. There's a particular reason, there's a particular story. Yours is different, your footprint is different, your story is different. Thanks for helping. Right? A little messy. Always seek him. That was part of the sermon we were looking at the other time, right? Thou shalt not make any graven images, and then they're commanded in the wilderness to create a graven image. And if you did not look to that image, you perish. We see these in scripture because we have to admit that humbly we don't see, right? We don't see the other side. We don't see the, the line that's shooting up on the other side. We don't see like in Hebrews 11. We don't see that what we're doing will, will match to them and we'll end up there. We don't see that like Moses was supposed to enter the promised land, but he didn't. And so we think that he missed out. But in reality, he's like one of those people who together with us reaches the, the spiritual promised land, which is even greater, seeing the spiritual promise of Jesus right now. But he was so focused on the one thing he wanted to hear. Right? You'll be Abraham's promise to be a father of many nations. And he didn't see that. We see these promises they don't get. And they look like messes to us. I, I don't even know if we can go through all of these. Start this was probably way more down than I wrote. 
Cold, starved, prison, flogging, explosives, lashes, beaten with rods, shipwreck, daily pressure, hard work, open seas, rivers, bandits, pretenders, cities, naked, in uh, unknown countries, and being sleepless. This was all just one, one little section. So there was plenty more. I'm sure there's even more that he was talking about. He was blinded. He got beaten up by a mob. He got dragged out because they thought he was dead. Question. Prison again. Divisions. Prison. He even wanted to go to prison because that was his opportunity to go and talk to Caesar. That's a messy life. That is a messy life. Jesus' attitude was always whatever you want. He always did what the Father did. But that doesn't mean that every once in a while he wouldn't say, but Lord, if it's... Because if the King of Glory goes to the Father and says, Lord, if it's your will to take this away, you can too. You can. This is me. I'm still working it out. I got highs and lows. I mean, the, the highest point right there is me speaking at Pastor Jim's church. <laughs> actually, look, it's, it's the part you laughing at my jokes. That's actually... <laughs> But your image is part of the greater image. So, it looks messy, right? Yeah. Okay, let's see a mess over here. Our next contestant, our next contestant hails from Columbus. shows that you're working. Your mess shows that you're trying. You're living. Don't let it go to waste. From God's perspective, it's beautiful. And to Him, it's wonderful. And it will reap a harvest on the other side if you persevere. The messes, right? Part of the issue with that was it was zoomed in. If you could zoom out, you could, you could see it better. And then if you could just twist, you could see it even better. There's ideas of, of knitting. One side, the, when you knit something, is you have all the frays, you have all the little pieces of, of rope and of twine. But on the other side, it's a beautiful image. This concept 
is basically what God is doing. He's working on us, but we just see the mess. We can't see the right perspective. We're so zoomed in that we don't know the beauty that he's working on. You do your part, which is whatever he's telling you to do, which might be a mess, and it will turn into a message. Persevere. Stick through it. He builds your faith through it. He builds a testimony. He builds perseverance. He grows your character. He develops you. So think about your mess. Oh, well, there's the reveal. So. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Right? Your mess, your parts, all come together to make the image of Jesus, to make the promises. That's right. To make God's ultimate plan revealed. Whether you see it in your life or you see it later. You can kind of see a little bit of Paul in there and Joseph. And we got Christ. But when you're zoomed in, you don't see this. You don't see this. It's hard to see this. You have to trust God with what you don't see. Absolutely pray. Pray and ask God. And if you have a default, go to your default. But allow God to let your mess become part of his greatest message. Good job. Amen. So, um, dear Lord, we just thank you for your message. We thank you for the messes that you give us. We ask that we would have wisdom and understanding. We ask that we would receive whatever's from you today. And Lord, we ask that we would see and perceive our situation however you would like us to. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Well, thank you. And I also want to just touch on... Um, Naomi and Mike, Naomi has a His Story production, which is really awesome. Uh, so please talk to her about that. She does biblical um, performances, uh, really wonderful. Spirit, she's spiritual moms, all sorts of great stuff. Uh, do you have any pamphlets in the back? Um, I brought little bookmarks. Okay, she's got some bookmarks, so go get yourself a bookmark. And then I've got some information on both follower back there. I was gonna try to come to Lawrence's event. Work's not gonna let me. Thank you so much. Glory to God. Thank you, Pastor.